So tonight's lecture, multi-trait, multi-method models, which are like CFAs on steroids, so to speak. And so that's why we spent weeks covering CFA, like ad nauseum, right? Because they are the measurement models. They're the basis for many of our other models. So, you know, when we get to full structural models last week, it's like, this is path analysis plus CFA. Multi-trait, multi-method models are essentially kind of like bifactor models. So a multi-trait, multi-method, which I'm now just going to call MTMM because it's easier to say, is a model where I'm going to examine traits. Okay. Um, these are our latent factors that we're trying to measure. So this is like IQ, or in this case, we're going to talk about what I lovingly call MERPUS, okay, which is meaning and purpose. Okay. Um, and you'll see why it's MERPUS in a little bit. Okay. Methods are the way that I'm measuring those factors. So I can now start to disentangle the question is how much of this is the actual latent variable and how much of this is the way I'm measuring it, which I know someone asked earlier in the semester. Give me some time. <laughs> So we're going to try to see if we can figure out, you know, is it because of the way I'm measuring it or is it because it's the latent variable and some of this error is because of the method. So Dave Kenny is kind of the father of, of mediation, <laughs> actually, but um, has a really good uh, section on his website on MTMM. It's, um, let's say I love Dave. I do. He's really cool. <laughs> it is not pretty. It reminds me of like old school GeoCities. I feel like it needs an under construction um, little logo on the top for its perfection, but it's so full of great information that if you're interested in MTMM and you want to learn more, um, this website will help you learn more. <clears throat> okay, so when would I use this? Like, what is the use case of an MTMM okay, over just our basic CFA? And so it's going to allow us to ask several questions that we can't with a CFA. So the first one is convergent validity. Okay, so convergent validity is this idea that different measurements or different assessments um, converge. They measure the same underlying trait. And that's helpful because some assessments are free and some are not so it's really nice to find ones that okay they both measure the same thing and this one's free so I can use that one uh, so we have a lot of scales uh, like psychologists love scales we do um, so for example we've talked about the DAS the depression anxiety and uh, stress scale there's a Beck depression inventory there's the um, very popular CESD centers for epidemiological something. I don't even know if I remember what CSD stands for, but it measures depression. Okay. So a lot of those assessments, do they converge? Do they all actually measure depression? Okay. So we would like measurement one and measurement two and measurement, you know, five, six, seven to all assess traits equally well. Okay. So we could also look into kind of which trait is, which measurement is better, but we're mostly going to focus on, um, do they converge? So they measure our traits equally well. Discriminant validity allows us to think, there's two types here. So discriminant validity is how much do these different assessment measures diverge? So while we want them to converge, right, we want our assessments to both measure meaning or both measure purpose equally well. We don't want both assessments to be exactly the same. Because if we're going to use more than one scale, we would love to capture the whole latent variable. Okay. And so remember that these uh, measurement tools are, are, are why we think the latent variable is the reason that we get the answers on our measurement tools. Um, but we would like to get the whole range of the latent variable. Okay. And so if I have two scales, this would tell me... Um, how much they're measuring exactly the same amount of variance or if they're measuring different types of variance. And so I could maybe combine measures to get a more thorough assessment of the latent variable. Okay. So that's discriminate. They discriminate from each other. There's also um, a separate discriminant validity that we'll talk about um, where 
Um, <clears throat> So measurement one and measurement two assess each trait differently, but we would also like to know that there's discrimination in the traits. Okay. So we have convergent validity. So both of these are about the measure. Right. How much do these two measures assess the traits and how much do they separate in their methods? Okay. But we also maybe need discriminant validity of the traits, okay. meaning that our latent variables are not perfectly correlated. But these two taken together when talking about measurement indicate that, that measurement, each measurement is maybe equally useful. So they both measure the traits, okay, meaning and purpose, and they measure different parts of meaning and purpose for this example. The other form here is sometimes what's called measure, uh, method effects. Okay. So how much do the measurements cause the overlap in traits? And we'd like this to really be low. Right, so we want measurement one to measure trait one and trait two differently. And we'll, we'll, how we'll really get into this here is we want to make sure that the um, traits are what we're measuring and not the methods. Right, so I want to make sure that whatever scales I'm using, I'm actually measuring the latent variable, and it's not just because I'm using that scale. And um, if that scale measures these two separate traits exactly the same way, you can't discriminate between the traits. So it's a method effect, maybe, that this scale doesn't differentiate between depression and stress, for example. Or it's a latent variable problem. Okay. So there's sort of two sides to that. We could either have a, a, a measurement tool that doesn't discriminate between two cases, um, or we could have what is really one latent variable that we're saying is two. Either way, we would want to make sure that these things are actually separate from each other. So the logic here of MTMM is that we'll have several models that are kind of going to be similar to bifactor models. And we're going to test those questions sequentially and compare them using a nested chi-square test. So we'll use the ANOVA function. We could use AIC or ECVI, which we've been using as um, our non-nested test. But generally, if you see someone talking about MTMM, they're going to use a, uh, a chi-square test. The other thing I'll have you do is actually look at a model comparison rule we'll use a lot next week, where the change in CFI between two models if it's greater than 0.01, that's considered a significant change in fit. Okay. So if one model's 0.95 and the other model's 0.94, the 0.94 model is worse. Because okay. remember that CFI is a goodness of fit measure and we want it to be large. Okay. So we're going to kind of do both the ANOVA function and the CFI one. And then next week we'll use the CFI one a lot. So what are these steps? There are two main approaches to the MTMM. One of them is considered the Weidemann approach, which will have four models but three steps. The other one is considered the correlated uniqueness approach. I would say that most, I would, what I would do, the couple of times I've done one of these, is start with the Weidemann approach. If you cannot get it to run, because that can happen, um, switch to the correlated uniqueness approach. Um, dog has decided to come in here and rough house. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, because correlating uniqueness is just a tedious thing to program in, um, in Levon. Okay, and I'll show you why at the end of the lecture. So this specification is going to differ slightly than our normal CFA because it's, it's a CFA, but not quite. And so we're not going to use the manifest variable scaling. This is the only time you'll hear me say this. We're not doing it. Okay. This and latent growth models. Okay. So we're, we're going to move away, although it pains me, away from manifest variable scaling. Instead, we're going to set the variance of each latent variable to 1 using standardized dot Levon equals true. Okay. And that's just going to help us make these models run a lot better. And we're going to look at the standardized all anyway, so, you know, it, it will be fine. 
<laughs> so we're going to switch the the focus here onto the the loadings and put the the scaling factor on the latent variable. You could do that all semester. But we've mostly avoided it because then we could look at all of the standardized solutions. But now we pretty much can't avoid it. All right. So model one. This model is called the Correlated Traits Correlated Methods Model. And I put the big long names at the top because um, it just helps me remember which one I'm doing. Because model one, model two are not very mnemonic names. Okay. But step one, basically, is where we allow the traits to correlate, like our normal measurement model. We also program in method latent variables and allow them to correlate. Okay, and I have pictures here to help you conceptualize this. You do not cross-correlate methods and traits, though. So it's essentially like two CFA measurement models crammed into one, okay, which is very similar to bifactor models. Now, in a bifactor model, we turned off all of the correlations. That's not exactly what's happening here. Okay? We're allowing each side to correlate with only itself, so only traits and only methods. And we're going to apply this to specific scales in a minute to help solidify traits versus methods. So how do we force Levon to do that? Well, I can't use the orthogonal equals true like we did for bifactor models because that'll turn them all off and then we have to turn them all back on. So it's actually a little bit easier to just turn them off. Okay, just the ones we're interested in. So what we do is we say latent variable tilde tilde is correlated with zero times the other latent variable. And that will force the path to be off. It'll be zero. All right, so what does this look like? So we talked about two different sides. We think about this as kind of like dueling banjos, if you will. So we've got a method side. This is our, our, our scales, our, our measurement tools, whatever they are. And then we've got a traits side. This is our normal CFA um, latent variables. Okay. So trait one here is um, X11, X12, and X13. But measurement one here is x11, x21, x2, x31. Okay. So it shouldn't have the same pattern of, of measured variables. Okay. And so uh, one thing that people do tend to do wrong when you're typing these out yourself is that you uh, program both sides as the same. Okay, don't do that. Okay. So method one is tied to all of its methods. Okay, trait one is tied to its indicator variables. So every measurement variable is going to have two arrows coming in okay, from different sources. All right. So in this correlated traits, correlated methods model, this is the one that if something's going to go wrong, it's probably this one. Because let's say um, we have true two two sorry two methods that are perfectly correlated. Those methods measure the latent variables in the exact same way. Okay. That's going to be very hard for this model to estimate because there's a lot going on here, right? We have the correlations between methods, the correlations between traits, all of these loadings, and all of the variances. That's a lot of estimation points. And generally what happens is the, the covariance matrix on the latents, okay, our correlations here, tend to be estimated at over 1. And so that can happen. Okay. So the biggest complaint about MTMM that you'll see is that often um, it will cause a Haywood case okay, uh, with a negative error variance or correlation over one. It can be one of one or two different ones. And if you can't fix it, that's when you can move to correlated, a correlated uniqueness model. Okay, it has less of that problem, but it's more difficult to interpret. And that's generally just because these are complex models. Many of these latent variables are correlated on purpose. That's the purpose of doing this task is to think about discrimination and convergence. So, you know, it can be hard to estimate mathematically. And so what can I do? Well, if you get a negative variance, if you get a correlation over one, there's not a whole lot you can do. But if you get a negative variance, the first thing you can do is if it's on a measured variable, manifest variable, just calculate the variance of the actual variable and set it to that, because okay, you have the data. 
if you get this on something where you don't know the variance, because maybe you only have the correlation matrix, or um, it's on a latent variable, you can set it to something small and positive. Okay, for many moons, I think all of the textbooks which say set it to 0, 0, 001. Okay, I think that's an unusually small number to set a variance to. Okay. So I tend to look at what the data is. I look at my standard error, that kind of stuff. And I set it to that okay, when this happens. And if you really don't know, the other thing you can do is set it equal to another small positive parameter. So if you know that that variance is probably similar to the variance on another variable, you set them equal to each other. So three different ways to handle a negative variance. We're not going to have that problem today. Um, you will see that problem on the big assignment for the CFAs. Okay. Bifactor models have the same issue. All right. Now, once we start adding these other models, they're all compared to this original model. Model one represents our best case scenario, where our traits, okay, these are our, um, our latent variables, the things we're interested in, are correlated, because otherwise, why are they on the same scale, right? But not perfectly. They're at least a little bit discriminant. And they're estimated by our measurements, so we're capturing some of the error is actually due to the measurement, but not perfectly. So this is a scenario where each measurement adds something to the equation, and the traits are separate from each other. And what we'll do is compare everything to that scenario. Sometimes we want it to be worse than that scenario, and sometimes we want it to be equal to that scenario. But model one is always our best case scenario. And we never want model two to be better. We want it either to be worse or to be equivalent. So let's look. So, in this data set, I have friends, and they study uh, meaning in life, sometimes called logotherapy. Um, there's this whole sort of meaning resilience movement, especially now. Like, uh, some people call this grit. Um, I don't know that people like grit as much as this sort of meaning, but like purpose-driven lives, okay, is the kind of like clinical work that some friends of mine do. These are the same people who study um, resilience after natural disasters. It all kind of correlates together. Okay? And so we have tons of data. We have scales coming out our ears. They're so great. And I've always kind of been interested in this concept of, of we're, we use five or six scales to measure the same thing. And I'm always wondering, like, can we just pick one or, or maybe one of them? And are we really measuring different things? So there's this, there's this underlying question in that field of, is it meaning? Is it purpose? Is it resilience? Is it grit? Is it hardiness? Which one is it? Or are we all using different words for the same thing? Personally, I'm on, we're all using different words for the same thing. Um, but there are some new some sort of models, like theoretical models, that propose some different ideas. But I have some data. Let's test this hypothesis. Now, I will tell you this is not how I'd really test this hypothesis um, because there are some better, newer scales, but this is a bunch of data I have and I, I know pretty well. So let's try this out. Okay. So we're going to use two popular scales, the Meaning in Life Questionnaire by Skeeger and colleagues and the Purpose in Life Questionnaire um, by Krumba and Halik. Okay. And I just picked some questions that are face validity appear to measure meaning. Okay, my life has meaning is one of them. Um, and that's the trait. So we're trying to capture meaning. Meaningful life. My life has meaning. Then we're going to measure purpose. I, my life has purpose. I live a purposeful life. I do things on purpose. And so that's a different set of questions on the MLQ and the PIL. Now, there are more questions. The MLQ actually has a question seven. <laughs> and the PIL is almost is 20 questions. Um, but these are the ones that face-wise look like those two words. Okay, they either include that word or they match pretty well. Now, methods-wise, we have two. The purpose in life questionnaire, or the purpose in life test, rather, 
Um, that's everything in our data frame labeled with a P and the meaning of life questionnaire, which is everything in our data frame labeled with an M. Let's see what happens. These are probably the two most popular scales. Uh, the MLQ is probably a little bit more popular. There's a new version of the purpose in life test called the purpose in life short form that has gained popularity um, as well because it's four questions it tends to work pretty well. Um, but I am biased because I was part of that. <laughs> so full disclosure, um, it's a short test that seems to work. <laughs> so uh, I'm also a big fan of the MLQ. But why should I use both, right? So if I'm working in a study, other than the fact that this is 14 questions, it's not a whole lot more, but should I even consider using both? All right, so I'm gonna import, I have the raw data this time. This is one of the first lectures I think we've had in a while with the actual data, but here's the data frame. You have a bunch of people measured on a bunch of, of different scales, and we'll use part of this data frame for the assignment as well. So I actually have two other scales in here as well. Um, the uh, life purpose questionnaire, which is a true false version of, of the purpose in life questionnaire, and the song, the seeking of noetic goals questionnaire. And so we'll, we'll use some of that other data for the class assignment part. Now, this is the key part we're gonna focus on here is the building because most of the other stuff doesn't change. So the first thing I'm gonna do, uh, which is always just good practice, is build the two CFAs separately. Okay. With the warning that one of them may not work by itself. So I've built the methods model. This is all of my MLQ questions, and then all of my pill questions. Easy enough. Built my traits model. These are all my meaning questions. These are all my purpose questions. So those are two CFAs, one for methods, one for traits. And then we're gonna do our traditional steps, analyze. And I can already tell, I'm probably gonna have some problems. Okay. My methods model ran just fine. Okay, notice I did standardize on the latent variable. Okay. My traits model, not so much. So I ran my traits correlation, and here's the issue. Okay. It has actually estimated the correlation between meaning and purpose to be perfectly negative, which just like blows my mind because they're actually perfectly positively correlated because <laughs> it's Merpus, right? So um, that's clearly not right. Now, my traits model doesn't run by itself which is probably bad because my traits model is the actual interesting latent variable measurement model, right? But it isn't maybe the end of the world. Okay. So what I can do from here is put them together and see if it runs. Okay. Because maybe some of the problem with the traits model is the methods. So I can control for the methods and see what happens with my traits. But this is kind of a precursor warning that we're gonna find th that the traits are problematic. Um, so in this case, with this negative correlation, my solution is I like, would normally would just have to quit because there's not a whole lot you can do when the Haywood case is on the latent variable like this. Um, except maybe look for some other correlated error issues because uh, you will get output. Remember, the output is only is not very trustworthy. <laughs> it might be trustworthy for investigation, but not for any kind of publication. So let's look at our methods just real quick. Okay. We'll I'll spend a whole lot of time on this model because um, this is only half of the, the equation, right? But in general, we wouldn't expect a methods model to be good. Okay. So one of the big things about these models is there's less of a focus. I mean, some people focus, still look at the, the fit of the model. Right, so if you have a, a model where the CFI is 0.2, you're not really <laughs> doing a very good job. But there's less of a, like, it must be above 0.9 and it must be below 0.10, right? Because we're really more interested in that model comparison with the caveat that a very bad fitting model doesn't tell me much of anything anyway. And so I'm just kind of looking at it to make sure this isn't the worst thing ever. And I'm gonna put them together 
to see if we can at least get it to hold up together. So a lot of the focus on MTMM is more on the comparisons and less on the, the actual like Red Sea. All right, so I do have to zoom out just a little bit. Okay. So now our estimates over here is the same things are standardized on the latent variable, but we're really interested in standardized all. So one particular potential problem, although this isn't like the worst thing, is like that some of them are negative okay, with each other, which is a little weird for this scale. Okay. Like I don't, they shouldn't negatively correlate with the latent variable. These are all in the positive direction. Okay, so maybe some of that's what's going on um, for, for some of my issues. Now I can see that these two questionnaires have a very high, this is methods correlation, so that's kind of worrisome, but maybe it's a high methods correlation because there's a high trait correlation. So I can't at the moment distinguish between um, this just being the scales or this also being the fact that maybe the traits or all, it's one latent variable. So over here, what we're capturing is the fact that these both measure the one latent variable okay. All right. Now, this is multi-trait, multi-method for a reason. You can't really totally do this with one latent variable. So we've got to have multiple traits. All right, now I did the summary of the traits fit and just ran it, but I would mostly use this to investigate what the heck is going on. So something is weird. Something here is very strange. Okay. Um, and so I'd have to figure out if I can fix this. What I'd probably do is look at the, um, if I needed to fix it, I would look at the um, setting the correlation to something really high to see if I can just get the model to even run or if it's actually a negative um, observed variable variance that's the issue. But notice how our variances are pretty different here. Right. So for some of these, they're much larger than others, potentially also an issue. So they're being estimated a little differently and that's because they're negative. So maybe I forgot to reverse code this. Like there's a couple places that I could start to investigate use modification indices, but this model is not valid to report. Just a reminder. All right. And then I just diagrammed them to follow our four step rules that we've been using. And we can see that there's a really high correlation here. And so we'll have to investigate. Is this methods or, or an issue with the traits? All right. So back to correlated traits, correlated methods. So that's the two measurement models. And mostly I just run those to see, like, where is this going to blow up? Okay, probably traits. Right. So to put those together, the other, there is another reason to run those two models. We'll get to that in a second. But to put those two together, we just, oops, sorry, literally slap them together. Okay? So put the, it doesn't matter which one is first, but put the methods model in, the meaning model, and the, the traits model in the same code. And turn off the cross loadings. So by cross loadings here, I mean that the methods latent variables do not correlate with the traits latent variables. They only correlate with each other. Okay. It's correlated traits to themselves, correlated methods to themselves, no cross. Okay. And so I say, okay, the MLQ is not correlated with meaning. The MLQ here is, the pill is not correlated with meaning. MLQ is not correlated with purpose. And the pill is not correlated with purpose. It's a little easier to turn them off rather than turn them all on all off and turn them on eh, most people do it this way okay well, you could say our orthogonal equals true and then only turn some of them on um, but this is this is a little easier so what happens does it run we already know that traits is problematic but does this run actually yeah and so maybe what's happening is some of that methods some of the trait problem is in the methods so it's an, an error that the methods handles a little better. All right, so our basic CFA. Um, now let's do our summary and let's check our normal rules. Okay. So I'm gonna scroll, 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 variances. Are they all positive? Yep. Okay. 
Are all of my R squareds less than one? Yes. Can I learn how to handle my computer? Are all of my correlations less than one? Yes. Well, the absolute value of one. Yep. Ooh. But here's why that model, the traits only model, blew up. Look at that bad boy. That's so close to one. And I don't know if this is negatively correlated because I haven't reverse coded something somewhere, but in theory, these probably should not be negatively correlated. Okay. All these little negatives in here make me suspicious as well okay. because the MLQ should be positively correlated with itself. Okay. Um, but, you know, all of our, all of our Haywood case checks are okay. All of our standard errors. So some of these were measuring better than others. One, I think they're both one to sevens, so, or they've had that kind of range. So, you know, that's not my problem. Um, what else? Then we can look at fit. And the fit of this model is actually pretty good. Okay. So when I account for both halves of the model, the methods and the traits, that's a pretty good fitting model. When I only do one half, it either blows up or is not a very good fitting model. So that kind of implies that there is some method variance in there. It is not all accounted for by the latent variables. Some of it's due to the methods. All right, and that's not too surprising, right? Because there's no perfect measurement. Right? Okay, well, we're comparing everything to this model, so I don't have to spend a lot of time interpreting this particular one. Yeah, but I just uh, also diagrammed it so we can kind of look and see that the two arrows pointing into each one are from different components. So you didn't accidentally program the same thing twice. So MLQ and meaning, right? Hill and purpose, that kind of thing. All right, what now? Well, model two answers this convergence question. So we, it's the no traits correlated methods model. So we're gonna just take traits and get rid of them. We've actually already done this. It's the methods model from the first go round, but what we do is completely delete the trait late uh, <coughs> trait latent side. That's hard to say. And we're basically testing the methods only model. What does that tell me? Model one versus model two measures convergent validity. And I will 100% tell you that every time I do MTMM, I open up these notes and go, which one is which? <laughs> Which one is convergent? Which one's divergent? Um, because the names of these, while people try, are not the clearest things. Okay. So I know traits correlated methods model. You want this model to be bad, okay, as compared to model one, because um, the idea here, one more slide, um, is that model one has both traits and methods. Model two only has methods. If model two is better than model one, that means that everything is due to the methods and nothing is due to the traits. That's bad. Okay. You don't want a model where the predictor is better for just being the methods. Because then that implies that you're not actually measuring your latent variable very well. What you're measuring is the differences in your scales. Okay. And I want my scales to measure the latent variable and then there might be a little bit of leftover variance due to measurement error. Because okay. it's no, no measurement is perfect. So this is convergent validity because it implies if model two is worse than model one, that um, the methods are correlated. They're measuring the traits, um, but they're not the only reason for the model being good. Because we do want our methods to at least measure the traits. <laughs> okay. And that would be model one. Right? If it's only methods, that's bad. Okay. Model two. All right, so picture, we get rid of this. We don't want this model to be better than a model that also includes the traits. All right, so we've actually already programmed this model. So I just ran the ANOVA. Okay, we've actually looked at it um, at the very beginning. So you, if you want to, I, on the assignment, I basically just have you walk through this in the, the steps. You could just call this step two when you're programming it at the top. Um, 
But either way, the methods only side is step two. So I'm going to compare that to model one. I just didn't want to call this model one dot model and model one dot fit, but you can. <laughs> I was trying to keep it straight. Remember the ANOVA function will compare them, um, change the degrees of freedom difference, because we haven't done this in a while. And that's 16 degrees of freedom are different. Um, subtract the chi squares, and the one with the smaller chi square wins. So this is less than 0.05. And model one has a much better chi square. Now, I can also use the CFI to compare these. So model one has a CFI of 0.98, and model, model measurement only is 0.76. Okay. So having those traits are important, and these methods appear to converge on measuring those traits. And we'll talk more about how I can get that convergent thing um, uh, a little bit better. <clears throat> than just the overall fit after, we're, after this section. So in summary, it appears that we need those traits to interpret the data. It supports convergent validity that both of the, that these methods are, are converging on these traits. Now model three is a perfectly correlated traits and freely correlated methods. Okay, so we're adding the traits back in, but we're saying, you know what, these are perfect. There's no reason to have multiple latent variables um, because it's actually just one latent variable. Okay. And so this kind of asks that question, is it, is it meaning and purpose separate or is it purpose? Okay, it's all just meaning and purpose together. And we just let the methods correlate because we've already kind of shown that they're, they're worth their time. So by setting those covariances to one, what we're doing is we're trace, testing if the traits are exactly the same, which indicates that we're not measuring separate variables. This is part of discriminant validity. I don't want that to happen. I want model three to be worse than model one, okay, or said this way, model one should be better because if they're perfectly the same, that does not that implies that these are not different latent variables, and that's bad. And I hope you have seen with some foreshadowing here that that's not what we're going to find. Okay. Our traits model already blew up, so I'm a little worried about model three. <laughs> okay. um, now, it's not a per, it's not a, model three is not only traits. Hey, we're still going to include the methods. But we're going to say, you know what, this correlation is one. So effectively, this is a hypothesis test, testing if that, the pathways, the covariances between traits are less than one, because they can't be bigger than one. Right? So less than one. Now another thing we could do here too is set these to negative one. Um, I've always seen it positive one. I don't know if it matters. Hmm. But in our scenario, we've seen that these two scales, for some reason, correlated at negative one. So I might want to test negative one instead. But you'll see everybody talk about it being positive one. I actually don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to look it up. But basically, we just correlate them perfectly. Now, to do that practically in Levon, we're just going to add a new line down at the bottom. And this is only on the traits side. So um, I do meaning and purpose, which is my traits. So you just kind of keep it straight, which one's traits and which one's methods. Okay. So I say meaning is perfectly correlated with purpose. And I want to see if that model is worse than model one, where I estimate it freely. So we're on my second steps. I can look. I'm already not, I'm already concerned. This model seems to be pretty good, which is not a good sign because we want model three to be worse than model one. And we would check for all the same things that we've been checking for from the beginning. Okay. Now, I set this to one, so it's okay that that's one, right? But my variances are positive. My standard errors actually look pretty good. Um, my R squares are positive, right? It's the same normal things we look for, except we're not going to look at these parameter estimates until the end. Here's our pretty picture. 
oh no, it's bad. I look at the comparison between 1 and 3. Notice here this is 1 and 3. These do not step down. This is not hierarchical. Everything is compared to model 1. And it tells me, you know, you know, they're not different. Okay, my CFIs are exactly the same. And remember that a change of 0.01 is considered important. So what does that tell me? Our traits in this example are not discriminating. Meaning and purpose are the same. So with this um, result, I basically wouldn't, a multi-trait, if I decide to, com to collapse and say, okay, it's one measurement, I cannot really do a multi-trait model anymore because it's multi-trait for a reason. Okay. And so I'd have to go back to the drawing board and think about you know, what this latent variable actually is. So I have jokingly called it Merpus for a long time. Um, I think they're annoyed with me, but uh, it's more that we actually suspect this is a bifactor scenario. So that's a good place where these two models um, start to, con not converge, but um, tell you which one maybe is more appropriate. Okay. And in this scenario, um, we've done some bifactor stuff instead. Okay. So I would switch away from this to bifactor. All right, so model three is, 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 that's no good because it should be worse, but it's not. Now this last step is a little different. What we're going to do is we're going to um, allow the traits to do whatever they're going to do, the correlation there. And we're going to uncorrelate the methods. So we'll set the covariance between methods to zero because this would be a good scenario. That would imply that our methods are measuring differently. If the correlation between methods is very high, that implies that they're measuring in the exact same way. Okay, so this is a discriminant validity test on the methods. The last step was a discriminant validity test on the traits. Um, so in a, in a good scenario, traits are not one and methods are not zero. Our, our methods, I'm sorry, are zero, are. Because if I could come up with a perfect measurement scale, each of my assessment tools would measure a different part of the latent variable in this perfect like pie cutting way where none of it overlaps. Because that would give me the most power. I would learn the most about the variance there. Um, so like in a regression, right, we don't want our, our predictors to be super correlated. That's called multicollinearity because then you're measuring the same thing twice. And so essentially we're asking, are these multicollinear, right? Are they measuring in the same way? And we want them to not. So to test that, we set it to zero. Okay. And if the model um, where the method correlation is zero is good, that implies that they're pretty separate things. So they're discriminate. They're measuring different components, different, ooh, wrong word, um, different pieces of the latent variables. So we actually want this one to be equal, model one and model four to be equal. And I feel like there's a lot of arguments about this step, like how correlated do the methods have to get before it's bad, right? So we're testing this against zero, but maybe we actually believe that a little overlap between methods is good. So zero is the traditional way to test this, but I would say that you could come up with a number that you're interested in. So I wanna make sure that my methods aren't half correlated. Right. So I would set that to 0.5 okay. um, in a standardized scenario. Right. And since we're standardizing on the latent variable, I can do that. Okay. That's another reason why we standardized on the latent variable was so that we could use this perfect correlation um, code. Right. Because if we didn't standardize on the latent variable, uh, back up, back up, we'd have to know what this number should be. But by standardizing it, we're making it one. So that's another reason why we're shifting the standardization. Um, it makes it easier to run. So here I could say, okay, I just don't want the correlation to be above 0.4. That kind of thing. Um, it's a little harder to test because this is essentially testing it against zero. Um, to test it, like I don't want it to be above four, you kind of have to um, test it 
uh, kind of like a step down procedure. There are certain ways to do it. I'm not totally positive exact. I can't remember exactly how to do this in Levon because I had to look it up one time. But there are ways to test um, sort of greater than or less than using one tail tests. But this will effectively answer our question. And so here's the idea behind that one. It's the traits are normal and the methods are uncorrelated. They're each assessing a different little piece. And in that model, this is pretty easy. We just set pill equal to zero times MLQ. Notice that this is not additive. So in model uh, three, we had meaning tilde tilde one times purpose. I took that out because we're comparing model four to model one. So two, three, and four don't add together. This is not hierarchical in any form. All right, what happens? Dun, 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 dun. The model runs okay. Phew. okay. It's actually a pretty good model, which is what we want. And we would look at all of our normal stuff. Um, you know, R, R, this is still bad. <laughs> yeah, right? So that's why we got a, a, a problem on the first model. Right? It's because there, it's Merpus. Right? So all this stuff is positive. Standard errors don't look bad. Our R squareds are positive and less than one. Our covariances are very close to one, which is no good. Okay. Um, it can be negative. That's a negative correlation. No big deal. So model looks okay, minus that one fact. I could, okay, I've plotted the model. And what, what gets people is, don't forget, this one we want them to be equivalent. Okay. So this indicates that our scales assess these measures differently. So there's divergent validity in the methods. Okay. So you actually want this step to be the same. And so I've measured, looked at my CFI, and they're the same. So we've got like half good results, half bad results. So in summary, um, I got to rethink my latent variables, but otherwise these measurements seem okay. But I don't actually know what they're measuring. Right? So that, that model three of the, the traits are the same thing is particularly problematic. Now those are the Wideman kind of steps. The other way that we can do this is correlated uniqueness. Now I find correlated uniqueness a big old pain to program. Um, but if my first step, model one, in the Wideman steps does not run, this might be my answer. Okay. Now I've investigated and figured out that the reason mine is like kind of got the hiccups is because I need to rethink the latent variables. So that's a different problem. But um, we could think about convergent di discriminant validity, the same questions, using a correlated uniqueness approach. So instead of building a trait side and a method side, what we do is we build the trait side, and then for the method side, we correlate all of the measured variables. So we intercorrelate the um, error terms for all the measured variables because that's actually what's happening is that the measurement, because they're all on the same scale. Um, now to do that, very practically, like code-wise, I started to run it and then I was like, oh my god, I'm going to lose my mind. This takes so long to code. Um, let's go back to this picture. So let's say, to do that code-wise, what I would have to do, this model is a little simpler, is I'd say, this one, tilde, tilde, this one. This one, tilde, tilde, this one. This one, tilde, tilde, this one, and repeat that. Okay. So for our Merpus model here, what I'd have to do is uh, M1, tilde, tilde, M2, M1, tilde, tilde, M5, M10, M3, M4, M6, M8. I hope you're getting the point <laughs> because this, it would take, it just takes a long time to type, which is not a good reason not to do something, um, <laughs> but... <laughs> That's one one issue with this model. Is it's like complex to program in the sense that if you have a lot of manifest variables um, and a couple methods, you're going to be like typing out all those correlated points one at a time. Okay. Unless there's some magic that I'm just not aware of code-wise that would do that for you. Okay. 
Now, once you get that typed out and run, how do I interpret it? Because there's no comparison. There's one model. That's the only model you run. Okay. So how do I approach that model? Okay. And really what you can do is interpret the parameters of the model, which is going to be very similar to what I can actually do with model one. And so some mm -hmm. people have suggested if you can get model one to run, just interpret the parameters. There's no need to do all this extra testing. Mm -hmm. So that's actually what we're going to do now. Um, we're going to interpret these parameters. And I will say this is actually probably a lot easier using the interactive components in RStudio. So that's what we're going to do. And let's just hit this button here and let everything run. Oh boy. Okay, so all that thinks really hard about loading simplot. Okay. So for convergent validity, what we would like to see is that the trait loadings are higher than the methods loadings. Okay. And I'm using model one here. If I was using a correlated uniqueness one, what I would do is look at the trait loading and look at all the error correlations and make the tr sure the trait loading is higher than the error correlations. So it's the same basic procedure. It's just um, here we compare that trait to its error term correlations. So this is why using the completely standardized solution is the answer. Okay. And this effectively answers this question, is the trait effect bigger than the method effect? Okay. Which we haven't quite captured, right? So with convergent validity, what we want to know is are these methods both measuring our traits sort of equally well. They both measure the traits. Well, by having them in the model and the model being okay kind of implies that. Um, but I haven't really dis like distinguished yet if, if the measurement is on the latent variable side or on the traits side, or on the method side, sorry. We've talked about whether or not the traits are too correlated or the methods are uncorrelated, but we haven't really captured like if the variance is on the wrong side, right? So if the variance is all due to methods, that's not good. Okay. And so what we want to do, step four fit dot found. Oh, something went wrong. Oh, it probably just couldn't find the data file. Oh, sorry. Sometimes using um, um, projects works great, and sometimes it just goes bonk. I don't totally understand. Did that work? Okay, that's what it was grumpy about. So let's just rerun model one here. Methods, methods, apologies. Step one. Step one. <coughs> Perfect. Let's go all the way down to the bottom. And what I'm going to do here is look, you know, we could print these parameter estimates out, but I also really think viewing them just makes it easier. Mostly because that is interactive, right? I don't want to put this in my markdown because um, you, know, you can't really print this and interact with it. But now what I can do is just sort here by the right-hand side. Okay. And that will put them next to each other. Makes it so much easier. So we want to make sure that the, um, let's go back to the slide, that the trait loading is higher than the method loading. So this is the trait loading, and I could probably write some fancy code, but you know, just for visualization purposes here. So the trait loading is 0.8. That's higher than the methods loading, which is 0.05. Okay. All right, now come down here to 10. Right. Scroll, 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 scroll. 0.3. That's not higher than this negative 0.6, so that's bad. Okay. Come down here to 2.2. Okay, it's better on the MLQ side. That's no good. Okay, so you're starting to see the pattern, I think. Um, uh, let's see here. Here's M3. Here's the trait side. Okay, standardize all, sorry. 0 0.09 versus the method side. 0 0.8. So this is, this is not good. Okay, 
And part of this is because of my over my like too much correlation between traits. Um, but what we want is the the standardized loading for the trait side to be bigger than the method side more often than not. Okay. And, and ideally every single time, but you know, life is not perfect that way. So what what I if I if you start to um, to really look dig into what the issue is here, um, the meaning side seems to go okay, um, but the purpose side does not. Okay, so I might have misspecified the model. All right. So I, I printed out the table here, but it's easier if I put them next to each other because you know I, otherwise I'm comparing here to here, and it can be kind of I'm sorry. Uh, we gotta scroll all the way down to get down to the the standardized all option. It's just easier to sort them in in our studio. All right. The other option that you want to look at is a little simpler to see. So, for discriminant validity, discriminant validity, we want our trait correlations to be low. Um, which implies that traits are different things. Now, low here is a, is a relative term. In the steps, we tested them against one because we don't want them to be one. But this is really where I could get way deeper into how different do I want my traits to be. Right? So I could also test it against zero, but I think that's an implausible answer um, because most many traits are correlated. Right, so let me see if I can get the whole... I can't quite get it to look pretty. So let's see here without zooming out so far you can't read. <clears throat> so what we want to do for this one, we want trait correlation. So let's go find that trait correlation. So that's going to be uh, da, 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 da. here. Traits, meaning and purpose. And so our standardized all, oh, gosh. line 55 is 0.97. 0.8987. That's no good. Okay. So we'd want this value to be low. And I, I, in a in good world, a good discrimination for these is 0.5 maybe okay, to make up a number. That is definitely higher than 0.5. <laughs> so we can already tell that this is still bad. Okay. So I could look at the parameter or I could run the model. Now for model four, the discriminative validity question um, about the methods correlations, we want that also to be low, which implies the methods are not exactly the same. That would be the good scenario, so you don't want them to be close to one. And so we come back all the way down here again, and this is where I could pick. Right? So we test the method correlation against zero, but that model might fail. I could say, well, okay, I'm just interested as long as the confidence interval doesn't contain 0.4. Okay. And so let's look here. Where the heck? Lower, upper, here. Okay, I did not make that up on purpose. Okay, so the confidence interval here for the, the correlation between the methods um, does contain zero, so that's good. That's why it was significant. Um, uh, not, it was a good model when zero was set to the parameter. Okay. Um, but I could say, okay, I just don't want it to be outside this bounds. So we can start to use our confidence intervals rather than, than model comparisons to pick a spot that we're interested in. So I could also do that with the previous one. I could say, well, as long as they're not correlated above 0.6. Okay. So I could look at the confidence interval, which this is bad, right? This confidence interval should not go outside of one and say, oops, yikes, it is both sides are above 0.6, negative in this case. Okay. Um, that's no good, crap. Okay. And then here I could say, okay, as long as it's not above 0.4, okay. or includes 0.4, for example. So that gives us a little bit more room to test a, a specific hypothesis rather than just a zero versus one. Um, because those are like the extremes, but I think sometimes testing methods against a zero is a little, um, you're setting, you're almost setting yourself up for failure 
because uh, many methods correlate highly. So you're hoping that it's all traits, but no method is perfect. So, um, you know, testing it against zero may not actually be what we're interested in. We just want to make sure they're not super correlated. Right? So we can change. You can you can set these predetermined rules, right? I could say, okay, I just don't want my methods correlation confidence interval to include 0.4. Um, I want it to like I want 0.4 to be outside on the positive end and it to be all lower than that. Right? So you could just um, predetermine what your spots are for this new cutoff score. Okay. All right, so all together, what have we learned? MTMM is cool, yeah? So we can take um, everything we know about CFAs and now start to combine that approach for, from bifactor to examine for confirmatory and discriminant validity using this multi-trait, multi-method analysis. If your decision is it's not multi-trait, you kind of have to stop and do something else. So in our scenario, that would be my final decision from this model, right? Is that it's not multi-trait, I need to rethink this latent variable thing. Go back to the drawing board. Okay. And we've talked about how instead of interpreting model, you know, differences between model fit measures, okay, that have their pros and cons, we could instead look at parameter estimates, or you can do both. Really, if you're going to interpret these models, do both sets. In this case, they converge. They tell me the same answer. Okay. Um, and then how to, we went back over how to compare models, right? So we talked about CFI. We're going to use that a lot next week. And the ANOVA test, okay, the chi-square difference um, method using ANOVA as the function. Okay. And specifically, also, we looked at setting our cross loadings to 0 and 1. We've kind of touched on this off and on, but now it's very specific, like do this code to, to set a parameter to a specific value. And that's also how we handle Haywood cases, right? So if we have a, a negative variance on a observed latent variable, I could set that variance by doing variable tilde tilde, you know, the variance 2.5 times that variable. Okay. And so that's one thing I really love about Levon is that the code um, is very flexible to allow me to control each parameter specifically. Um, and it's also like similar enough that I can like, you know, I could do this as covariance or I could do this as variance. So it's really nicely set up. All right, so that's MTMM.